So a book we wanted to discuss on the show, highly recommended. It's called Two Brothers, The Life and Times of Bobby and Jack Charlton. Jonathan Wilson is the author and we spoke to Jonathan before he ventured out to Doha. So the book is very, very in-depth. It's very nuanced. It's full of great detail. And their relationship, the Bobby and Jack relationship, it's not necessarily the core of the book. It's not the constant. There are chapters on their disparate lives where the other is barely even mentioned. And yet it was the obvious jumping off point uh, with Jonathan in the conversation, as you might expect. And there are so many points of interest when you try and chart their uh, relationship. 1966, the shots of them hugging on their knees on the Wembley turf. And yet they're not bosom buddies at that stage. They didn't celebrate together that evening. They went off in different directions. 1958, at Jack's wedding, Bobby is the best man. Bobby didn't in turn ask Jack, it seems. And again, much of this is reported already. But Jack had never warmed to Bobby's wife, Norma, and vice versa. Norma found Jack boorish. She found her uh, mother-in-law, Sissy, overbearing that she hadn't given her a, a fair chance. Jack felt that Norma looked down on the family and all of this was bubbling away and tensions came to a head when Jack detailed these issues in his autobiography, which Bobby, ever private, uh, was furious over. And this was very tough in the family. There's an extraordinary moment where their father, when he is very ill, is reported to have said, well, if Bobby sends flowers for the funeral, throw them in the fire. And there are tales of Bobby going home to Ashington to do events and not popping in to see his mother. And he was very much the favourite growing up. So that is some of the context for where we jump off here. The book finishes with the last time we saw the pair together in public. It was the BBC Awards in 08. Bobby is receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. Jack is on stage as part of the presentation. And at this stage, relations are bad. They don't really make eye contact. They can't seem to bring themselves to reconcile. And Jack says, and it's incredibly moving if you haven't seen the clip, he's the best player in the world and he's my brother. And it struck everybody as moving at the time. And when you read Jonathan's book, and that's the closing, it's ever more moving. And so I put it to Jonathan to kick off the interview that that moment, those few words from Jack, uh, spoke volumes. Yes. And how characteristic of Jack, who was in his very sort of bluff, uh, uncomplicated way, was an incredibly eloquent man. And how fitting that he could nail that final line, he's my brother. Yeah, That is the right final line. I mean, it's the right final line for my book, but it's the right final line for our public understanding of their relationship. Um, and that's a hugely moving uh, moment. At, at the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Awards, when when Bobby's getting lifetime achievement and Jack presents it to him, um, but but their relationship had not been good for twenty or thirty years before that, um, and and yeah, as, as you say, it, it it is Bobby's relationship with Norma. I think I think it'd be wrong to try and cast fault. Um, I'm not sure anybody really is to blame, but certainly from the outside, I think it'd be wrong to try and work out who was at fault. Uh, I, I think. Norma struggled a bit with, with, well, with Jack and certainly with with Sissy. Um, I think Sissy recognised Bobby was very much marrying somebody of a different class. Uh, was it was sort of the uh, the reification of of his move away from actions and his move away from 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 that very working class life, which Jack, yeah, you know, he clearly made his money, um, sort of still somehow stayed much more connected to. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious that, that she didn't really like the fact that Norma had a career and, and was a, a modern woman in, you know, in, in the terms of the, of the early sixties. Uh, and so I, I can see why, why the two, uh, rubbed up, rubbed each other up the wrong way. Um, and I, I don't, I think it's very easy for people to, to blame Norma. But City stopped sending the grandkids Christmas cards and birthday cards. That's that's a pretty cold act. Um, again, I don't know what precipitated that, and I don't want to cast blame. But it seems to me that that both of them were were very um, strong women, and they didn't get on, and and, and that um, led to Bobby sort of being caught in the middle and ending up 
as I guess people tend to, siding with his wife. And you mentioned this idea that when he went to Ashington, he 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 wouldn't pop in to see uh, Sissy. I think there's there's also suggestions that occasionally he he did go to see her but didn't tell Norma. Uh, having said that, I think there's evidence that when Sissy moved into a home uh, early nineties, um, that certainly those last few years, Bobby didn't go to visit, and I think that's what Jack found really unforgivable, mm. and I think that's why that that anger came out. His, his autobiography was I think it was ninety six it came out, or maybe 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 early ninety seven. Um, and I think that's why that wound was so raw. And then, as you say, from Bobby's point of view, that's an unforgivable betrayal of something that should be kept private. Yes. Um, saying he's my brother at the end is so um, astute on Jack's part because in that line and in that, you know, in front of cameras and millions of people, he's effectively saying, ultimately, though, all is forgiven. We still love each other. It's, yeah, um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And you see the whatever coldness that crept into the relationship, they, they did still love each other. Mm. Um, and and that, that's it's important that we know that, you know, I don't think any, you know, I don't, I, I'm an only child. I've never had a brother, but I, I find it hard to believe that any brothers who've fallen out, that there's, there's not some still, still some vestige of, of warmth there. You do open the book with uh, an amazing account of life in the pits. So this is Jack's experience of the pits, aged 15. He's, uh, he's lasting one day of his 16-week apprenticeship. And you say uh, at one point, everybody knew somebody who had died in Linton Colliery. And that wasn't even uh, a mine that was, uh, you know, blemished with really disastrous tragedies. But even then, everybody knew somebody who died. Dark, windy hot and cold, deafening when shots were fired. Most miners had scars down their spines from scraping against the roofs of low tunnels. And Jack, who had been uh, a touch afraid of the humiliation of going on trial at Leeds and, and coming back a failure, had maybe passed up on that opportunity and was was in the mine. And, and one day was all it took, uh, not surprisingly for him to realize that this was not for him. There's something very profound about uh, Jack who went off on this extraordinary adventure in life glimpsing hell glimpsing what it could have been i i suspect that can't ever leave him yes um yeah because as you say Le- Le- leeds had, had offered him a trial and and nobody thought jack was good enough that, that's the other thing that yeah when 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 leeds offer him a trial sissy says no no you you mean bobby you don't, you don't mean jack surely no no we, we want the defender we want the big one um, and I think Jack must have known at the back of his mind that the only reason he got that trial was because four of his uncles had played for Leeds and two of them were still connected with the club. Um, there was a family favour. or at, at least Leeds had been sort of pointed in his direction by by family connections. So I can see why he doubted that. And, and you know, it's one of the one of the things about those mining communities. Um, and I, I sort of grew up, yeah, I grew up during the miners' strikes. It was right at the tail end of this. Um, and I, I I grew up on the north edge of Sunderland, um, near Whipper, which had had a colliery till the till the mid sixties. So it, 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 I, I sort of caught very much a tail end of this, but I was still aware of this. Those communities were very very close knit, and there's a lot of great stuff in that. So the the miners' welfare's, they gave you sporting facilities, and that meant if you're good at sport, you had a phenomenal chance to succeed. And that's why someone like Ashington produced not just the Charltons, mm. but also Jimmy Adamson, who, who lived on their street, who lived on Beatrice Street, and he precedes them as football of the year. So in the space of six years, this one street in this one 30,000 population, large village, small town, whatever you want to call it, produced three footballers of the year. It also produced Steve Harmison and Mark Wood, who've both won World Cups, the Cricket World Cups for England. So this is, a, a, you know, a, the the reason that sporting talent can flourish somewhere like that is these miners' associations, mm. the welfare associations. They put on these great concerts to get really big stars in. They provide uh, adult education classes so that the Pittman painters, uh, I mean, there's been plays and films about them. Um, there's an exhibition still at the the colliery at Woodhorn, uh, the, yeah, the former colliery at Woodhorn, which is now a heritage site. Mm. And and you know, they I sort of went along to that thinking, ah. Yeah, are they, are they actually any good? Yeah, they're really good. Hmm. Not all of them, but a couple of them are genuinely 
yeah, great paintings. Um, and they had this extraordinary cultural impact. So the first exhibition of Western art in Mao's China was these painters from Ashington because of his adult education classes that taught people how to paint. Um, so the Miners Welfare Association is doing great things. It is that sense of community. People look out for you if things are going wrong. Mm. Uh, and obviously in a community where death and injury are part of life because of the mine, that's essential. Yeah. The downside of it is you can't leave. And if you betray that community by leaving, the consequences are profound. And Jack hated the idea of leaving and coming back as a failure and having to sort of try and reintegrate. And Sissy had the same thing. She went away to be a mother's help in Watford initially, uh, was treated pretty badly by the family. She moved to Leeds where she had a lot of family because of, of, of four of them playing football there. And it was only when she got ill that she came back to Ashington and she ended up working in a... Um, a butcher shop um but she'd experienced that sense of going away and feeling the hostility when she came back and that's what jack wants to avoid mm. um but then yeah he goes down the pit and it's like okay i'll risk the hostility i can't do this mm. and I, I guess it's it's worse for him because he's six foot three that you know the 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 taller you are obviously the, the smaller the mine effectively is um but yeah, I mean, reading those accounts of what the mines were like, even in the 20th century, the the danger, the the, the noise, the the extremes of heat and cold, the mice everywhere. Um, the thing that when you read the accounts, the thing that a lot of people talk about is just these strange noises of the earth shifting, um, which become because it's such a sort of otherworldly place, become attributed to ghosts, and you sort of think, well, that seems weird. But on the other hand, the reality of that of that being the earth moving and you're in the in the earth setting off explosives, maybe ghosts are actually the less terrifying of those two possibilities. Mm. Um so yeah, one day down there and Jack sort of thought, right, I've got to get out. Yeah. Uh, but his his first his first recourse is to apply to join the police. Um and it's only chance that Leeds come back and say, How about that trial? Mm. And he, the the interview with the police is gonna be on the Friday evening. And the trial with Leeds is on the Saturday morning, so he has to choose between them. Yeah, and he thinks, right, I'll, I'll, I'll try and man the football. Yeah, amazing sliding doors moment. I don't know if you subscribe to nature or nurture, but it seems like Jack and Bobby come out of the womb as Jack and Bobby. You know, in TV, <laughs> uh, Jack is full of devilment. He wanders far away from home. He gets in scrapes. He has schemes to make money. He once was convinced that he had a particularly hard head, so he headbutted a pavement just to prove this. Whereas Bobby hates fuss, hates trouble, uh, very attached to his mother, Sissy. Uh, quite interestingly, she makes the observation she didn't think he was shy. She thought he was just self-contained. Uh, but their characters seem to be formed very early on. I mean, oh, I mean, it's, it's like a, a cliche, really, of the two, if you had to guess what they were like as kids. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I, I, I guess I guess it, it's both nature and nurture because that's how their parents were. Sissy was very gregarious and outgoing. And Bob, the father, he just likes to go down his allotment and lock himself away with his pigeons and his vegetables. And he's forever adopting, you know, knackered old pit ponies. Um, he's obviously got this very compassionate side, which he, he likes to keep hidden. Doesn't really like football. He's a, you know, he's a boxing man. The great story that you know, the way he, he won the money to, to buy the... The engagement ring for Sissy is one of these traveling traveling fairs where uh you know if you can knock down a professional boxer, you win a pound. And he he does knock down the professional boxer and um but yeah, you know, that's that's how he can afford the engagement ring. Mm. So they, they they Jack is clearly like Sissy, uh Bobby is clearly like Bob yeah. in, in terms of personality. Um and yet Sissy, because of Bobby's footballing ability, I think it's pretty obvious Bobby is is the favoured one early on. Although what's interesting is uh, Tommy, so there's two more sons who come, there's a bit of a gap. There's, there's um, Jack and Bobby, and then there's a gap, and then there's um, Tommy and Gordon. And Tommy, is, I think he's nine years younger than Bobby. And I, I guess by the time he's sort of sentient and, and able to understand these things, he thinks Jack is the favoured one, which I'm guessing is probably that period, uh, late 50s, when things do begin to change, or early 60s, post-Munich, after 
after Bobby's met Norma. Yeah. There's just a, like, we don't need to go through certain things that everybody's aware of. So, but for instance, uh, Munich, I had never thought about it from Jack's side. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, a brilliant harrowing detailing of everything that happened on that runway. But when word filters back home, uh, you talk about the Leeds United Secretary, Arthur Crother, in tears in the Leeds dressing room, Jack's naked with his towel after his shower and the news is broken. And so Jack rings Pat, breaks down on the phone. It's let's get the train to Ashington and they stop off in Newcastle and he um, decides to buy the late edition of the Evening Chronicle. And, and it's and it's in that paper he finds out Bobby in the survived. Press. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's survived and he he dances a jig. I'd never, I, I, one of these weird things, I'd never much thought of where was Jack when Munich was happening. That, so he was rushing home and, and, and didn't know. Yeah, and, and I think that, again, it's, um, I, I think with mobile phones now, we sort of assume that you know everything immediately. And and you know, those details of uh, Jack sitting on the train, hearing other people, not realizing who he is, talking about the crash and sort of speculating on who's dead and who's heard what rumors. And of course, nobody actually knows anything because they don't even, you know, they don't have, like obviously they don't have Twitter. They don't have the facility to, to ring people up. The, the, the calls they're making, are, they have to find a, a fixed line. So buying the paper suddenly becomes, you know, it's, it's not something you do because you've got an hour and you want something to read. That's how you find out the news. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to I, I, again, if this is the benefit of being from the area, like Haymarket bus station, God knows how many hours I've wasted the Haymarket bus station. I imagine it looked pretty different in those days. But yeah, it's very easy to picture Jack waiting for that bus to Ashington mm. uh, on this yeah, cold February evening. It's dark, yeah, dark, probably not many people about. And he goes over to the, the kiosk and, and buys the paper and yeah, sees, yeah, Bobby's okay, Bobby's safe. Yeah. Uh, their relationship with football is super interesting uh, right through their careers and uh, fittingly they end up with managers who suit their relationship with the game so Jack uh, despite the the wildness and the chaos and maybe you know you, you might assume he would uh, struggle for concentration at times he loves talking about the mechanics of the game he gets his coaching badges through the 60s and 70s it's, it's very clear from reading the book there is a kind of um a fertile atmosphere as as the war becomes more of a distant memory and you know different ideas are, are being spread on how to play the game and yet by contrast harry Gregg talks about if bobby sat down and you were talking about the match he'd leave you know he, he you say he preferred a bobby preferred a simple world of, of of great personal feats and heroes and glory and in in revy and busby it like it's incredible that, that matches up yeah completely um and yeah what's sorry <coughs> Oh, sorry. <coughs> What's fascinating about that is that Bobby, as a child, loved talking about football. Uh, so there's those stories of him reading out the the sports paper to uh, to Tanner, his his grandfather, um, and, and when his uncles come home, and you know, four uncles who are professional players, and they they take him to the club, and he has to stand at the door because he's not old enough to go in. And he, he stands there with his orange juice, imagining these great conversations they're having about football inside. And you, you wonder what he thinks those conversations are about, because as mm. soon as he actually gets those conversations about football, he hates them. Because I guess those conversations, you know, once he, he you know, once people like Noel Cantwell and um at Manchester United, they they talk about the structure of the game and how you plan training and how how you have to you know get the shape right and 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 this is a you know this is a very fertile time. I mean, maybe the last great fertile period for for tactical change. That the fifty eight World Cup, Brazil have played a back four. Uh, it's in Sweden, so everybody sees it. Everybody in Europe sees it. It's the first World Cup where there's a real sense that everybody who mattered was there and saw it. And every something like oh, Christ, the back four, it really works. You can't play wingers against the back four because um, you can't turn the defence the way you used to. You've got to rethink that. And these fullbacks can be very attacking. And of course, this is what England used when they win the World Cup in 66. And it leads to this uh, this you know, great general conversation about how can we play. And there's innovations almost sort of week by week as people are trying different things. And of course, English football, the defeat to Hungary in, in 53, has woken England up to the fact that, uh, hang on, our old way maybe doesn't work anymore. We've got to find something new. So this is this very fecund period 
and you have people like like Revy, like like Shankly, um, coming through, uh, like Ron Greenwood, uh, like Malcolm Allison, like Revy, uh, who were working out new ways of playing the game. But Busby is from a generation before that. Now Busby was innovative in the years immediately after the Second World War, and yeah, you know, the the forty eight Cup final, um. There's sort of a, a minor scandal because he dares to mark Stanley Matthews. He uses Charlie Mitten slightly deeper. And Stanley Matthews is appalled by this. He sort of complained to Charlie Mitten during the game. What, what are you doing? Like, get up there. You're, you're a forward. Um, but he, he didn't have that systematized vision of football that you would need. And so there's that great line of John Aston after the United win the European Cup, after they beat Benfica in 68, after they, you're 10 years on from Munich, they finally complete this quest. And because of the emotional nature of that, I think we sort of forget just how bizarre it was they did do it. It was obviously a great achievement emotionally and in terms of rebuilding the team and, and in terms of team spirit and in terms of great individuals like Bobby, like Best. Um, but it was a very old-fashioned form of football. So there's that great line of John Aston. We were like the last man to win Wimbledon with a wooden racket. Mm. And I think there was a real sense of this is the end of the old school. And it's almost as if the the emotional momentum that they've got, the sense of of, of of somehow completing that quest that began at Munich is what carries them through. And then immediately begins to fall apart because it's yeah. not modern football. Yeah. Their football is five, 10 years out of date. And within that's why within six years of that, they're, they're relegated. Mm. Whereas Revy and Leeds, totally different. Go from strength to strength. And, and I, I think... You can. Well, I, 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 I tried to make the case. The the reason they didn't win more was because they were too good. Yeah. So they were just they were in too many competitions. So they were, you know, they they every season it felt they got to the semi finals of the FA Cup, the semi finals of the League Cup, the semi finals of the European Cup or the Fairs Cup. They were in the title race, and every season they collapse in April because yeah. they they they've played sixty or seventy games and they're knackered. You're talking to an audience, John Giles on the show every Thursday and often harks back to that period and has talked at length about that period. So even younger Irish listeners are, who are off the ball listeners are weirdly au fait with Revy's leads and, and know a lot <laughs> about them. So I, I, I must put that theory to him and see what he makes of it. But I, it, it rang true for me because you do make the point that that notion of squad rotation, a big squad going deep in several competitions, we're 30 years away from that really. We're Ferguson. Yeah. Well, in, 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 in 1970, um, they 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 they're out of the title race uh, over so it's over the Easter weekend they've got a game away at Derby Clough's Derby mm. uh, and they're playing Celtic in the European Cup semi final four days later three days later um, and I think they've got the cup final coming up as well um, and they they rest a load of players this game at Derby get beaten four one and Clough goes mad at them for disrespecting Derby fans. And the FA fine them, mm. or maybe the league fines them, but they get fined for, for dropping four or five players when they've got European Cup semi-finals and big FA Cup games coming up. And yeah, the difference in mentality, the, the idea that yeah, you shouldn't players don't need rest, you just flog them through till they break. Yeah, um, and and that it's somehow disrespectful to the opposition to 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 leave out four or five players. It's very um tempting if we were to ask about them as players to to talk about Jack because the trajectory of his improvement is so stunning and you you do make the point that when Bob and Sissy are at Wembley uh, it's her proudest moment Sissy's proudest moment because Jack has reached Bobby's peak you know and which I think it's such a bizarre thing to say yeah I mean she said it's, it's, it's an interview in the early 70s when she says this and you can completely understand um her saying my proudest moment was at Wembley on that day, 1966, when my two boys, or two of my four boys, lead England to glory in the World Cup. That's totally normal, reasonable thing for mother to say. To say that was my proudest moment because that was the day that Jack reached our Bobby's level. Hmm. That's such an odd thing. That's you, you see, you sense the resentment of Bobby, that Bobby's been the golden child, and actually she doesn't like Bobby anymore. So she wants Jack to catch him up, and that's the day when it happens. But it's also such a profound thing to say, because after that day, you know, that's the first thing Jack ever wins. He's won well, promotion, but it's the first trophy he ever wins as the World Cup. And after that day, Bobby wins the league next year, the European Cup, and nothing else. Whereas Jack starts 
he's you know, he, he's collecting club medals for the two first cups, the League Cup, the the FA Cup, and the League title. Yeah, and yeah, so it is tempting to look, you know, the great improvement in Jack's career, and he was surprised even to get the England call up and the Revy effect on him. But it, it is like to overlook because it's a less complicated thing to say, but it's worth stating just how damn good Bobby Charlton uh, was. Like we are just talking about. Uh, a phenomenon, you know, and I mentioned John Giles on the show, he'll say Bobby's the best, you know, he's he's seen and he's as, as good a judge of player as anyone uh, has been. Probably just take his um, his heroics for granted. Even the footage we have of the goals at the World Cup in 66 or the 68 final, I mean, it's like his, his finisher, that, that ball in front post where he hooks it into the back corner is absolutely yeah. um, stunning. And, you know, he's only, what, 30 then? But as you say, the, the the premature baldness and the comb over, and and the puffed out cheeks, it like it gives him. Um, well, and the personality. And the personality, all of this almost um, kind of covers over a touch just what a genius this guy was, what a force of nature, maybe more than genius. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, two of the things where it really surprised me researching the book. So, an, an obvious thing to do when you're writing a book like this is to find contemporary newspaper reports. You're comparing them uh, or talking about the two of them together. And when they manage that brief period in the early 70s, you get loads of that. But I sort of assume, well, when they play again, particularly that 64 uh, 5 season when United and Leeds, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they get to the semi final, they play each other in the semi final of the cup, they're vying for the league title. And you sort of think, oh, there must be loads of stuff going into those games of these two brothers on opposite sides. There's none of it. Because Jack wasn't taken seriously as a player, he just wasn't a thief. You know, he's a totally different level of footballer. Um, and and that, he was twenty nine at the time. Twenty nine when he gets his England call up in, uh, which was what April, it was a day of the day of the FA Cup semi final replay in, in April. Um, and I think that that suggests just how, um, well, just how ordinary a player Jack was for the first half, maybe even the first two thirds of his career. Mm. Uh, that that. He was just seen on a. Why would you compare them? Because they're not comparable. Mm-hmm. And and then the other thing was, and it, again, you you're right. It's something that's obvious. It's right there in front of you, and somehow you just don't notice it because you you sort of take it for granted. Yeah. Bobby Charlton's the greatest English footballer has ever been, and there's actually no comparison. There's nobody who comes close in in terms of achievement, in terms of the way he played, in terms of scoring crucial goals at crucial times. You know, he he won the World Cup. He won the European Cup. Uh, he scored crucial goals in the final of the European Cup. He scored both goals in the semi-final of the World Cup. And he won his uh, three league titles. Um, well, FA Cup in 63. Um, uh, you know, his his achievements are, are extraordinary. And then you factor in, that comes after Munich. Yeah. And, and to have the strength of of character and personality, although he clearly was deeply affected by Munich, to come back from that, that you know, in a in a narrative sense, in a dramatic sense, the, that period, 58 to 68, is the greatest story in English football history. Manchester United, mm. a tragedy in Munich, rebuild the team, mm. 10 years on, win the European Cup. That's, that's the greatest story. And that's one of the reasons Manchester United became, you know, when the television age begins, with Match of the Day in 64, that's why they become the most popular team because they've got this extraordinary story. And it's driven really by two people, by Matt Busby mm. and by Bobby Charlton. Yeah. When it comes to management, uh, for a whole host of reasons, Bobby is just not uh, suitable for it. I mean, we talked about his, his, his level of interest in the mechanics of the game. Uh, one teammate or I suppose player of his recalls him being very nervous, even speaking to the team to the effect that his hand was shaking. Whereas Jack, and and I guess here's the question: we don't, you know, we're all very familiar with um, Charlton's management style, Jack Charlton's management style. He's initially seen as too disorganised to succeed. He spends lots of the week fishing and hunting, and then in the midst of it all, there are these like glimpses of of a great thinker. Like uh, at Middlesbrough, he puts a the gantry higher for a better TV angle. It's a very progressive thing to do. He understands the power of media. He puts white around their strip because Revy had always said, "Well, you know, white's better for peripheral vision." So, he, there, there are contradictions all over the place. And and you um you pose the question at one stage in the book when you're well into his 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 Ireland career that Charlton, you know, forgetting names, adept at creating chaos, 
and yet capitalizing in unexpected ways on on the chaos. I, I guess one of the interesting questions with Jack always has been, was that very thought out and very deliberate or was this guy wonderfully reactive to his own failings? Maybe a bit <laughs> of both, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it feeds from both directions. And I, I guess um, if you play that direct style of football where you, you're putting the ball in behind the defence, squeezing up, you know, a sort of fairly rudimentary form of pressing, but yeah, pioneering when he was doing it in English club football yeah, and, in the 70s. And, and again, you, you're you're talking to an audience very familiar with them. Like yeah. We've all heard the Desert Island Discs where he talks about going to Mexico 86 and seeing the... He's in uh, the pod and... How, yeah. yeah, how homogenous everything was and how it was ripe for this kind of pressure game. So like, he didn't just, you know, again, it, it could sound like he just played long ball because he didn't know any better. It's more thought out than that. Oh, it's a lot more thought out than that. No, it's a, it's a very, very... I mean, just long ball is, is such a sort of... It just it's a, it's a meaningless phrase. I mean, maybe with a even with a team like Wimbledon, it's backed up by sort of a real physicality and a. Uh, you, it only worked because they had uh, John Fashionu, um and they had in Dave Besson, the goalkeeper had a massive kick. It, it's even with Wimbledon slightly more subtle, but Jack seems it was a lot more yeah. thought through than that. And of course, it offends traditionalists who like to see, um, yeah close passing this sense of trying to impose control but there's two ways of, of playing football you can try and control the game or you can try and manage the chaos and neither is right and it's one of the great things of football as a sport that you can do either mm. and and in many ways the the interest even even in modern football between Klopp's chaos theory and Guardiola's control between you know if you want to be pretentious about it Dionysius and Apollo it's it's it, 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 football is that 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 um conflict between the two yeah um and so do you do you think he created a chaos um... well i i think i think modern football as it was as he was learning it yeah was just understanding pressing so so pressing sort of comes into being it sort of pops up uh in the soviet union in the netherlands and in england at roughly the same time mid 60s uh alf ramsey i i think was a genius who was partly because of his own cussedness and his refusal to talk about anything, um, and partly because of the environment in which he was, he was never appreciated. People didn't understand what he was doing. It's, oh, it's boring. You, you, I mean, I, I think I, um, I quote a couple of columnists in the book yeah, yeah. sort of saying, oh, all these football thinkers, it's ridiculous. It's not about thinking, which you know, we, we have just about moved on from that. Loads, even sort of 20 years ago, there was skepticism about whether it was worth paying too much attention to, to tactics. Hmm. Um and and then yeah, so so Jack sees from uh from Ramsey and, and to an extent from Revy the benefits of pressing. Uh and I think he takes it further than either. Mm. Partly maybe because he was working with with weaker teams. And I think that's also a uh a conflict that's never really resolved that he you know, he goes to Middlesbrough, uh who who were a sort of lower mid table, second flight side. And they get promoted I don't know, nine games at the end of the season. They, they, yeah, they, they, he's the only manager from the second flight like, ever to be named manager of the year. Um, and the only player he signs is Bobby Murdoch from Celtic, who's a great passer of the ball, mm. which seems totally contradictory. Mm. But he says, oh, well, the players weren't really good enough to play a more expansive, more progressive style. And then Sheffield Wednesday, he's dropped down to the third flight. And yeah, I think it's very justifiable there to say the players weren't that great. But then he signs Antim Rochevich, mm. this little Montenegrin playmaker. I doesn't really know what to do with him. It's just, yeah. Sticks him <laughs> I mean, on the left wing. Well, first of all, he sticks him in his house. He puts him up for <laughs> um, several weeks, uh, charging both Mirochevich and the club, taking you know, taking the rent from two sources. Yeah. Uh, Mirochevich, um, sort of totally bemused by being dragged out to go fishing in the lake in Barnsley when he doesn't really want to go. Yeah. Um, terrified by these army assault courses he's made to go on. But yeah, you know, was a was a real quality ball player, and Jack yeah. didn't really have an interest in using him. And then, particularly when he gets to Newcastle, a but job we, he prob- we should say though, by the way, and this is the essence of Jack, still love Jack Charlton. I mean, it sounds yes, like that yeah, was yeah. A, a bad Mirochevich joke. Absolutely that adored him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and, and, and it's, it's, the thing he kept, kept going on about was you cannot believe how good he was at dominoes. Yeah. He was the king of dominoes. Yeah. But he and Billy, Billy Bremner played dominoes every Thursday night in a pub in Leeds. So I guess that, that that's the great training ground. You want to be good at dominoes. Is playing a pub in Leeds with Billy Bremner in the sixties, 
Uh, but yeah, Mirotovic absolutely adores him. You're right. You're right. You should say that. There's no hostility there. Where you do get hostility is, is at Newcastle, where he, you know, he he tries to make the case that, oh, this is the only style of football I could play. Hmm. Well, it was by the time he'd signed uh, George Riley and uh, the other centre forward, uh, Cunningham, um, and got rid of Terry McDermott and uh, John Truick. And basically ostracized Waddle and Beardsley. Yeah, yeah it is true. I think football you play if you buy two big lumps of centre forwards and get rid of all your skillful players. So that's I don't mean that as a criticism of this football. I, I think I think football is to be played whatever way you want to play. And I, I don't think you should get too hung up on aesthetic concerns. Hmm. Um what interests me about that is he seems to feel uncomfortable with the style of football he plays, as if he has to make excuses for it. Yeah. Uh, and I guess with Ireland, you can you can make a similar case that were there more skillful players, he could have made better use of. Could he could have used Liam Brady more? Well, yeah, maybe, but uh, I don't. Yeah, you, you, know, you can't deny it worked, which it didn't really work at Newcastle. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious what strikes you about the whole Irish phenomenon, and it is a phenomenon, really. What happened uh, from afar, like right from the off, you, you talk about his unveiling and. Um, in typical FAI fashion, the hiring situation, and it's it's well known here, is a bit of a farce, a little bit all over the place. And so at his first press conference, people want answers about how things were done. And Damon Dunphy asked a question in the public interest. And you're right, Jack snapped, I know you, you're an effing troublemaker. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm bigger than you are. If you want to step outside, I'm ready now. <laughs> Jack then grabbed his cap from the table, stood up and marched off to a ripple of applause from most of the assembled journalists. Even Dunphy wrote the following week, Jack made the assembled feel good about themselves, good about being Irish and optimistic about Ireland's football future. So right from the off and all the way through, it was unconventional, uh, deeply entertaining and effective. What struck you when you, when you or what struck you when you when you looked back on genuinely like an insane 10 years? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think a sense that um, the, the, you know, the, there was there was something there waiting to explode. Uh, that, that yeah, the near misses Ireland had had. Uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't that suddenly in the mid eighties you get a great generation of Irish footballers. There'd been great Irish footballers before, uh, arguably even in greater numbers in, in certain years, and just terrible luck and bad referees and uh, maybe you know the, uh, the 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 amateurishness of the whole structure. Yeah, it, it just cost them a point here and there that, that had been enough, and, and maybe then. It did, all it takes is somebody who has. I mean, Jack, quite apart from everything, anything else, had an absolutely cast iron self belief. Um, may actually maybe not quite about his own playing ability, but certainly about his that he was right about most things. Um, and, and so to have somebody that pig headed and that that convinced of their own rightness was probably what was needed to sort of ignore the FAI, just do it his own way, mm. um, and, and and to. To sort of just drag everybody with him, and of course he he then he gets the look. You have a Scotland goal in Bulgaria. Yeah, that's not Jack. That's just yeah. good luck. Yeah, and you must have had people like Owen Hand thinking, why couldn't have I had that yeah. that look? Yeah, why, why do I get done with goals just disallowed for no reason? Um, but then once once he gets the look, he absolutely capitalizes on it. Yeah, he sure does. Um, it's in, it's uh, interesting as well. Like you touched on almost the sense of abandonment in Ashington when Bobby marries above his station and like the issue of class because this is a book about more than just uh, football but that that bubbles up here and there for instance uh, Jack is obviously acutely aware of these things because when Bill Lampton the Leeds manager before Revy uh, Jack wants to have melon and soup because uh, he's hungry and Lampton kind of says that's not how it you, works. You can't have two starters, yeah. Yeah, and Jack gets a incredible. And the thing, and then, and then sorry, the, the crucial thing about that is it's not that we've paid for you to have one starter. It's yeah. Lampton saying that's not how you behave in it's a good restaurant. If, here, listen, Ashington boy, that's not the protocol in a restaurant. Don't you understand? There's a furious row. So yeah. Jack's obviously even sensitive to being put in his place from a class point of view. And and football, obviously, through these decades, is you know, as money um, comes into the game, uh, it's a very upwardly mobile set of players. And then the George Best revolution is another maybe aspect to that as well. Um, but but your sense of, of these two and class, I mean, they, they do tell a story. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, 
I mean, class always ends up getting wrapped up in other things. So I think, I think, yeah, Jack has a real sensitivity about class and about origins. And I think that's actually why he's so, um, possibly without even really being aware of it himself, he's so aware of the issue of the diaspora. So he's part of the Ashington diaspora, which is obviously tiny. Um, and he's aware of that conflict between those who stayed at home and the potential conflict between those who stayed at home and those who've left, quote unquote, to better themselves. Yeah. And he rides straight over that with Ireland. It's if they can play for us, they will play for us. And yeah, maybe we should ask why they've left and what we can do for them. And then we should ask what they can do for us and why not pool resources. And it's, it's, it's an amazing interview I saw with, with a kid. With, he's like 11 or 12 year old doing the interview. And Jack's answer to him on the issue of bringing in uh, Ray Houghton and John Aldridge, I think is the specifics of the question. Mm-hmm. He said like, oh God, I've never, like to, the, 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 the clarity to cut through the whole issue of are these people really Irish? Uh, it was I, I thought yeah, he, that's where you see that his smartness. Um, mm. So yeah, origins, class, and and I, you know it's it's a thing that I may or maybe this is a global issue, but certainly it's a British issue that we don't quite know what to do with people from obviously working class origins whose accent, whose dress sense, whose values mark them out very obviously as being working class who then make a lot of money. What class is Jack by the end of his life? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got the wealth of an upper-class man, but he's obviously not an upper-class man. Even though actually his interest of, of fishing and, and hunting, you would say are quite upper-class pursuits. Yeah. Um, so do, he's, do, you he's, think, he, do you think Bobby was trying to get away from his roots, consciously? No. I, well, that's a good question. I don't know. Was he trying to live to get away? I, I, I think with Bobby... Um, it was so obvious so early he was going to be a brilliant footballer. And I think even more than in, in you, know, you obviously have a load of families where you have a kid who's really, really good at football. Everybody can see they're really good at football. But you're not quite sure how good they are. Well, they were because there's four uncles that played professional football. Tanner, the grandfather, has trained all these footballers. Yeah. And Tanner's watched them playing in the schoolyard, coaching him through the school fence. Because he knows Bobby's going to be a professional footballer. Nobody doubts that. Um, so I think Bobby knew from a very early age that his future probably lay away from Ashington, away from the Northeast. Um, there was the opportunity to, to join Newcastle. Newcastle, one of the many clubs who offered him a trial. Mm. But Jackie Milburn, who was Sissy's cousin, um, you know, Newcastle's greatest ever player, I mean, maybe still, but certainly up until Shearer, uh, tells him not to bother. Mm. Tell, you know, so, you know, the I don't understand youth development. You're better off leaving. Uh, and Bobby had always had this trip of 1948 from, he listened to the cup final, Manchester United against Blackpool on the radio and sort of fell in love with this sort of very attacking, very young, very exciting Manchester United team. So his dream was always to play for Manchester United. So I, I think from him being sort of, what, 10 year old, he had that sense that he would end up living in Manchester and yeah. playing for Manchester United. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think leaving was al- was always there. It was it was never it was never anything he had to interrogate. Mm. And then he ends up living in Cheshire in you know a wealthy area because he's a wealthy man with a mm-hmm. with a with a wife who's got a good job. And um, I think maybe partly influenced by Norma, partly by his own temperament, he he becomes you know a Daily Mail reading, flag waving, royalist, middle class patriot. Yeah, Jack's view on life I think is a bit more. I don't think it's particularly thought through necessarily, but it's it's a bit more subtle than that. And there's that great documentary he does for Time Tees where he in in seventy one or seventy two called mm-hmm. Big Jacks of the World. You can find it on YouTube. It's yeah. it's an it's an astonishing documentary for a huge number of reasons. He's an irritatingly not, not, good presenter, by the he's way. He's an amazingly good presenter. <laughs> and he's presenting it in the style of somebody with an iPhone, not somebody with a massive camera being carried around by a bloke. Yeah. So the bit where he just climbs over the wall to talk to his old, you know, the people who bought his old house. Um, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he's a great presenter. Um, but he also, so he, 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 there's, a, there's a scene in the, where they go to the workmen's club for a pint on a Sunday morning. There's a, there's a very weird time shift in that where yeah. you, you sort of assume it must be kind of quite late because it's very dark and they're all sinking pints. And then he goes home for Sunday lunch and you learn it's noon. <laughs> so God knows what time he got there. Um, but anyway, um, and he says, 
And yeah, there's this panning shot of all these blokes sitting along the side of a pub or a bar in one of these miners' welfares, drinking their pints. Everybody's laughing, great atmosphere. And he says, oh, Northeastern people are the happiest people in the world. And then he, he sort of, there's this moment of, where he just sort of qualifies and goes, and that's why if you haven't left by in time in 19, you'll never get out. Mm. And you think the implication of what he's saying is you probably need to get out. Yeah. And this this happiness, these minors welfares, the the great bars, the great sporting facilities, the the, the great entertainment you get, that's actually a, a prison. It's actually, you know, it's 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 the the sort of the the bread and circuses that yeah. are, are distracting you from the actual big social issues. Um and he's very thoughtful. Yeah, sort of you move forward 20 years um so during the miners strike he was very much on the side of the miners he he actually lived very near scargill in barnsley mm. and was very pro scargill he marched with the miners but then there's another documentary or interview he does i think about 1990 1991 where he says talks about how devastating the miners strike was for Washington. and you go to Washington now and yeah you can see this is a place in severe decline and a terrible drug problem and social deprivation and i guess 1990 was perhaps even worse on you know immediate aftermath of the strike so he says you talk to many of the lads now and they'll say it was the best thing that ever happened because they could get out mm. and so he i think always had the sense of getting out was what you needed to do yeah uh, a final thought um it's funny reading the book maybe it's again maybe it's because i'm getting older or whatever but um it's funny you read you read this book and there's incredible detail of like individual games and individual days and you keep turning the pages and suddenly they're all men you know this passage of time is uh is uh is just so apparent not least because of the alzheimer's which afflicts them both and we again it's so typical of their two personalities even when they're not in control of their you know their kind of their choices bobby's battle has been very private and it's a statement and it, it will never be more than a statement, I suspect. Whereas in Jack, we have it laid bare in a documentary, like a glorious documentary and, and full of poignant moments. I think, you know, anyone who, who, who spots the moment where he's, he's, he names Paul McGrath, you know, a fellow who'd called by the wrong name for half his bloody <laughs> career, like there's, it's just dripping in, in, in awful poignancy, you know? And um, there's a sadness there, isn't there? Like the, the mm. lack of reconciliation and that they both struggle with this awful illness in their in their latter years yeah which is why i think 2008 and the um sports person sports personality of the year is so important that they did have that reconciliation but the yeah the alzheimer's um no i i i didn't yeah both my parents died of alzheimer's um i'm aware of just how horrific it is yeah. and that's one of the reasons i didn't approach either family uh for the book uh, partly, it, it's sort of just an editorial choice that I wanted to, it to. I wanted the book to be about their place in in, in sort of social history, rather than about their personalities. Uh, partly, I'm always uncomfortable when I talk to family members that I end up feeling that I owe the family member, and so then you find yourself pulling your punches at times and you're not being as critical as you maybe should be. And with my Clough book, I I, I found that. Um, but it was also that, yeah, you know, the last thing Norma needs is when she's trying to look after Bobby now is an idiot like me turning up and asking difficult questions. Mm. Um, I mean, I think we all knew, we all, uh, British journalists knew that things weren't right with Bobby when Wayne Rooney broke his goal scoring record. And yeah, the natural thing for Bobby Charlton, sort of, yeah, Manchester United ambassador, uh, well, board member, uh, he's still a board member. Uh, we sort of asked for him to be, to, you know, to, to do an interview on how great Rooney was and whatever. And he was sort of wheeled out for very, very awkward two or three minutes and we were told, no questions and please, you know, understand the situation here. And he gave this you know, very short statement. You could tell the eyes weren't quite there and you thought, oh Christ, he's gone as well. Mm. Um, and so many of that team have. Yeah, But that documentary, the Gabriel Clark documentary, like, I can't say I've gone, gone looking out for uh, depictions of Alzheimer's um, but that is the truest uh, representation of it I've seen. Those those moments, even you know the moment it starts that moment of obstreperousness, where Pat says to Jack, "Oh, the grandkids are down by the pond. Why don't you go and see them? Oh, don't want to 
Yeah. And I saw it. My dad was so like that. Just like, <laughs> don't want to. And you're like, oh, God, you definitely will enjoy this. This is clearly <laughs> the right thing to do. Just go. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and then occasionally, you know, memory mm. uh, is there. And, and you know, my, my dad could, I remember when I was doing the Clough book and my dad was already um, in, a, in a secure unit by then. Um, and telling him, go, go into the home, telling him I was doing the Clough book and saying, oh, do you remember Clough? And he looked at me like I was an absolute idiot and talked through in the most precise detail a hat trick he'd scored against Huddersfield or something. Um, so, yeah, um, the Alzheimer's is, is very sad. And, uh, you know, they end up getting it almost exactly the same stage of their lives. Mm. Uh, I couldn't recommend this enough. I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Like I could talk to you about George Best and Bobby for another 15 minutes, but um, I don't want to keep you here all day. <laughs> uh, Two Brothers is the name of the book there, The Life and Times of Bobby and Jackie Charlton. Jonathan Wilson, um, enjoy the World Cup. We'll talk to you again. Thanks very much.